morning, good afternoon, Y Whales, wherever you are. Uh, not sure what time of the day or night it is, uh, but hope you're not looking too hard at the crypto market because it is tanking pretty hard right now. But that's okay. Some of you guys like the volatility. Uh, I'm one of those included. Uh, but we have an extremely special guest here today with uh, Tegan Klein. Uh, but first, Stefan, how, how are you feeling today, sir? I am super extra excited. And I'm usually excited, but today is going to be very technical and like some really cool infrastructure stuff. So extra, extra excited for that to see all the, all, all the things they're working on. Fantastic. So, so Tegan, um, you've been in this game for a while. This is not your first uh, Web3 company. In fact, you have a number of successes uh, prior to this. Um, but just give us a rundown of kind of where you came from and, and how we got here today. Yeah, absolutely. So I actually grew up in a really small town in Ohio, and I kind of appreciated that small town upbringing, but I knew that I wanted to kind of pursue a career much beyond that and kind of business and finance. So I ventured to New York City uh, on a full scholarship. I worked my way up. I got into investment banking at Bank of America, so at a bulge bracket firm, then moved over to sales and trading at Barclays just to kind of see banking from both sides. Um, I did learn about Bitcoin in 2011. And it was there that I, the, the seed was planted. I kind of put it on the back shelf, went a traditional Wall Street path. And it was when I learned about Ethereum while I was working in sales and trading at Barclays in San Francisco that I really kind of, the light bulb went off and I kind of saw the future of finance, the future of internet and the internet and that radically changing. And I think that my time in banking really lended itself well to understanding Ethereum. And so I'm really grateful for that, that background. Um, and really kind of seeing the, the unnecessary friction points kind of live real time in banking. And so with Ethereum, we were, we were able to kind of remove some of those pieces. And, and what year, what year was that? Was that right when Ethereum first came out or was that with the introduction of kind of the more mature smart contracts? Okay. Yeah. So it was 2016. So, so early days. So, you, so yeah. you've been like a believer because I, I, I can't claim that as an OG in any way, shape or form, any OG status, because I saw it and I go, ah, that's a good evolution. We'll, we'll check back in a few years. And, and, you know, you were one of the one of the very few that just said, no, nope, this is enough. I can work with this. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, if I was a real OG, I would have dove in with Bitcoin. It was very different, different times then. It was much more difficult to buy Bitcoin. You had to either go to like Mt. Gox or, or other means to kind of go peer to peer. And I really have a lot of respect for those OG Bitcoiners because back then, like they didn't know if they would be arrested, like those that were contributing on Bitcoin. Um, so those are the real OGs. But yeah, with Ethereum, so I dove in kind of head first. I started going to events, really learning about the crypto ecosystem. I joined Orchid, which is backed by Andrews and Horowitz and Sequoia, so two top um, VC firms. And I led international business development and investor relations for Orchid and then helped them launch. Um, and then I was able to take a lot of that launch experience with me to the graph, help the graph launch. And now I'm a co-founder of Edge and Node, and we really are focused on Web3. And what's crazy is when we started, Web3 was like a dirty word. Everyone was like, don't talk about Web3, like put it, like, don't say that it's expensive. No one wants to think about infrastructure. And now people are realizing that like within Web3, it's actually where a lot of that value is captured. Um, and so we believe that Web3 needs to be like a fully decentralized stack. Um, and right now, the Web3 is getting a lot of attention. Uh, and a lot of Web2 companies are getting involved in Web3. But there's kind of this, this push and pull right now within the Web3 space. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to kind of get into it a bit. No, that's fabulous. And I, and I love hearing, you know, how much Web3 as a term is adopted, because I much prefer to tell people, yes, I'm in Web3. And then they look at you with the kind of their eyes gloss over and, and they just kind of like, well, listen to whatever you say. But if you say, oh, I'm in, you know, cryptocurrencies and everything else, like the next thing you know, you're, you're flipping through their Coinbase account, trying to give them, you know, what they should have exited Doge, you know, somewhere around 70 cents instead of where they're at today. So it's, it's clearly a much better way to describe what we do. And I'm not going to, you know, edge a node. We're going to have a lot of talk about that today, but, but the graph. And I mean, this is, this was a, a big turning point for a lot of what is now Web3. Yeah, absolutely. So Web3 is a brand new platform for fully decentralized applications to live. And so if we look at Web1, it was kind of companies creating content and sharing that content. Web2 was really when like platforms emerged, like Uber, Facebook, social media. Um, and it kind of made the, the individuals create a lot of the content on, on those platforms. And Web2 kind of makes us the user, right? And the internet wasn't 
created to like monetize the users by like selling ads and then selling those ads to the users or selling data in the background. But that's what the internet is incentivized to do. It's the business model surrounding Web 2. And with Web 3, we're breaking that business model open. We're giving the power back to the users, the ownership back to the users. But ownership is like one tiny piece of Web 3. Uh, Web 3, it does not equate to ownership. It's really about kind of finding this neutral playing field for the users to have the decision making, the users to have the power. Um, and to do that, you need to disrupt those platforms, disrupt those walled gardens that are holding that data in and really expand and blow that data open so it's transparent. And that's really where the graph comes in and kind of like what the what Google does for the web, web two, the graph does for web three, but it does it in a decentralized open source and permissionless way so that everyone can benefit from that data, not just those web two companies. So, so how does it work? So the graph kind of indexes, like what's, how, how, how does the technical side work? Like what's the use case, I guess? Yeah, so almost every application, or we call them like decentralized applications or dApps within the Web3 space is leveraging the data from the graph. And Vitalik, the co-founder of Ethereum, recently called the graph the data availability layer for Ethereum. So what the graph does, it's like the it's open data on top of blockchains. And the graph is blockchain agnostic. We support every every pro like protocol and project and network within the space. Uh, but a, a use case would be if you go to Uniswap.info, Uniswap is a decentralized exchange, a DEX, um, and all of that data on Uniswap.info is pulled via the graph. So you have this great data on blockchains, but it's not organized. And so without the graph, uh, you as a developer spend like a, a very long time trying to organize that data. And this is why there was that narrative in 2017 that there were no users on Ethereum. It's because you would open these dApps and it would take like an hour to load because the, the graph wasn't there yet. Um, and so with the launch of the graph, we make it about 10 times easier to build a dApp on blockchains. Um, so it's, it's like trade data, um, historical data, like any kind of data that exists on the blockchain, the graph organizes. So NFTs, DeFi, DAOs, like all the use cases. Yeah. Okay. So and just as a real quick, to be clear, so everyone understands, you know, it's not just one or two protocols. It's almost every project is touching the graph. And so you guys are built in almost like the DNS of Web3, correct? Yeah, that's, that's a great way to think about it. So we support over 27 different networks. So layer one blockchains like Near, Avalanche, Ethereum, but layer two blockchains as well, like Arbitrum, Optimism, ZK Sync, um, and then Oracles like Chainlink um, and side chains like Polygon as well. And then you have all these dApps on top. So like Uniswap Synthetics, Gnosis, Livepeer, um, Audius, which is like music on the blockchain. No, I was going to say, and somehow she's got time to do, to do more projects. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like an Amazon S3 type thing where you do storage on behalf of people, but you also organize the data versus just like letting you upload it. Is that a fair? So the storage comes in with like IPFS and Arweave as an example. So the graph actually indexes the data within those storage spaces. Um, but you can kind of think of the graph. I think of it kind of like a mix between Google, Apple, and then like the web. Um, yeah. And so we're really here to kind of decentralize everything that is centralized within Web3. And Moxie, who's the former CEO of Signal, um, but founder of Signal, he recently put out a post on just all of the issues with centralization within Web3. And this is what we've kind of been shouting from the rooftop since the beginning. It's like everything needs to be decentralized. And now that's becoming more and more clear with these Web2 developers kind of calling Web3 out. Um, and that being said, I think decentralization does take time. These pieces of the stack take time to one, build, but then two, in, integrate with one another so that they talk to each other. And so that's the phase that we're working on now within the Web3 space is really making sure like the graph talks to IPFS, talks to Arweave, talks to all of these different layers of the stack. So when you're, when you're, I mean, it, you're so like, and I hate to use the word centralized, but I mean, you truly have created, you know, the APIs and it has to be like true decentralization. You know, it, it, it's going to take a lot more time than people understand because, you know, the APIs that you guys have built and the, and the protocols that you guys have kind of helped to mature, like 
you've brought forward Web3 by years, if not decades, by doing, you know, the projects that you have. But, but you know, there's always the criticism. There's always the people that don't quite understand. But how political do, do you get kind of from the graph and maybe edge node level when, when people are saying, hey, we're thinking about doing this? Are they consulting with you? Because you guys are, are not, you're not the gatekeeper by means, but clearly you're the ones that will help process that data faster. Yeah, so with the graph, like some people say, like the graph is this monopoly, but the, the thing is, it's not. It's a, it's a public good, right? And it's permissionless. So though people within the graph ecosystem can help one another to onboard and to migrate, it very much is permissionless. So a lot of these applications actually just spun up on the graph without ever talking to anyone within any of the core dev teams, which is really exciting. And that's kind of why we've seen this insane growth. Like, 700% um, year over year growth that we've seen when it comes to like subgraphs queries, um, all of it. So it's really exciting. And subgraphs are the open APIs. So they're transparent so that the data is not gate kept. So what you see is this explosion of innovation when people use subgraphs because other people leverage that data. And so the Uniswap subgraph, that data is open. So then you see all of these wallets pulling that data, centralized companies like Coinbase, um, like CoinGecko, CoinMarketCap, all query that that subgraph from Uniswap. So it's really exciting and it's kind of, we've seen this explosion in innovation because of the data being open via the graph. You know, as long as we're <laughs> taking, entertaining us here talking about the graph, um, which is not why you're here today, but, but, but you know, when you talk about the APIs and, and everything that you're building, you're, you're bridging web two and you're also bridging web three. And so it's not a web 2.5 thing. It's you have to do a lot of work on the web two side to be able to talk to web three because they're in two entirely different networks. Um, and, and so, you know, the protocols that you're building can, is, is what will allow the migration from, from one to the next, correct? Well, so the APIs, the, the, the projects within the ecosystem, like the, the founders of the different applications, they actually build those APIs. So they're not really built within the graph, um, though we have like dev shops that help people build subgraphs. Um, but that being said, the graph is like this, that like it is a public good, so anyone can leverage it. Thinking of Web3 and adoption rates, and, and now oh, that we want to start getting Web2, we want Web2 companies to start utilizing Web3 protocols. And, and as we know, as we can see and, and understand the cost of going straight from Web2 to Web3 is, is the learning curve is huge. The cost is, is not quite there. And, um, but, but you're allowing these Web2 companies to touch Web3 without fully, you know, diving into that decentralized protocol? I would say, like, we've kind of taken this decentralization maximalist approach, and we've really built for decentralized use cases. I think that's really where we'll see this explosion in innovation and stuff that we can't do within Web2 or within centralized finance. Like, we've already seen that with DeFi but, and, and also NFTs, but I think there's a huge explosion to come of things that we cannot even fathom within Web2. Um, so though Web2 companies and centralized companies do leverage those subgraphs, I think that what we'll see is more um, founders kind of emerging within the space, kind of like what we've seen already, and building decentralized from day one, building on decentralized protocols. It gets tricky when Web2 gets involved in Web3 because Web2, their business models are in gatekeeping that data and keeping that data to themselves, whereas the graph makes it public. And so I think, and we're already kind of starting to see this like push-pull struggle, and a lot of Web2 companies have announced that they're going to get into NFTs, like Twitter and Instagram, um, Facebook's rebranding to Meta, but that's not real Web3, and it will never be real Web3 unless they give up those walled gardens, and that's their entire business model. So I don't see them doing that. So I think we're going to kind of see this this fight, and that's why I think there is this war on Web3 right now. Like, it's great that it's getting all this attention, but true Web3 is decentralized, and I think we'll get to that feature in, like, six months to, to 12 months. It, it, six to 12 months. Wow. That's, I mean, that's the most aggressive timeline that I've heard. So I, let me ask this question this way. And I ask almost everyone in terms of web one, you know, in that 92 to, to kind of 99, you know, era. And I ask everyone and I get different answers. Where do you feel we are in terms of, in terms of, you know, adoption? Um, you know, were we closer to like 94 where it's like people are still kind of just thinking about it or were we closer to kind of, you know, 99 where there's like mainstream adoption is right around. 
I think that with Bitcoin, we've seen mainstream adoption and it took what, like 12 years to get there. Ethereum, people are starting to learn about um, and that's becoming a little bit more mainstream, Ethereum 6. I would say we probably have like two years to go before it's main mainstream, but I think six to 12 months, it will be ready for mainstream. Um, and like NFTs have really gone mainstream as well and they've really kind of brought blockchains and, and Web3 into the fold. But the infrastructure for NFTs being decentralized and, and truly kind of bringing the promise of like this digital art that you buy that can be there forever and you're the only owner. Right now, a lot of NFTs, and I would say like 99% are centralized. And so like if OpenSea disappeared tomorrow, so many NFTs would be gone. And that's the case with a lot of the marketplaces. And that's just because like the staff wasn't ready for, for this mass wave of NFTs. But that mass wave that we've seen is what's kind of put the pressure on those that are building like that decentralized stack to move more quickly. And, and just so, because there's a lot of people listening in and we try to make sure there's clarification. The reason why that if NF, that if OpenSeas disappeared is because every, a lot of people, not everyone, a lot of people are using N, uh, OpenSeas contracts, meaning that if OpenSeas removed those contracts, you know, they're the ones that ultimately were the ones that did the minting. So there's, um, hence why the, the big projects, the big developers, uh, and we do the same for our project. We have an independent contract that lives on chain. Um, and, and, you know, with the open seas disappeared, our, our, our tokens would live forever. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's actually limiting the potential and limiting like the mainstream adoption and use cases with NFTs by keeping that gate kept, right? By keeping those contracts like centralized to OpenSea. And I love OpenSea. I think what they're doing for NFTs is like similar to what Coinbase did for crypto. It's like allowing mainstream to kind of bring it in. That being said, I think the, the platform that will ultimately win long term will be the one that decentralizes and makes everything open and, and transparent. And then we'll see like this flood wave of more innovation with NFTs um, once that happens. There, there's, there is a lot of education that's needed in the space yeah. because I can Absolutely. say that the statements that you just made, I mean, resonate very clearly with us and we understand them, but the majority of people right now are shaking their hand going, wait, I thought I, what do you mean if OpenSea goes away? What is, what is that? And then the, basically the yeah. only thing we can say is check the contracts on the NFTs you've owned. And if it's an, if it's an open seas, that's where it came through. And it's nothing wrong with that. You know, open is clearly well-funded and they're going to be around for a long time. We've just seen a little bit of controversy with OpenSea because there was one in incident where someone had like stolen art, alleged stolen art. They like revoked that art, but someone bought that stolen art. So now <clears throat> neither of those people have that art. And with like true decentralization, that that can't happen. You don't have that that kind of uh, intermediary to come and, and, and take that art away. So there's pros and cons to that intermediary, right? Like you want the insurance, but some, like you might also want to make sure if you're buying an NFT that you have it there forever. I'm curious, you mentioned six to 12 months, we will have a lot more like proper decentralization. Like what are the pieces that are missing? Like what are the, like you're like, okay, here's the list of the three main things that we just don't have. What are they? I think it's more that the pieces are there. For example, like, are we with storage? The graph with the indexing and querying, the graph doesn't yet support are we? We've announced that we are working on that integration, but it doesn't, it's not there yet. And so once you have that, then you can do a lot more within the space. Um, also, we're working on metadata for NFTs so that you there is not this centralization issue um, and you can have like metadata off chain still in a decentralized way. Um, we're working on that for IPFS and are we? So I think the pieces are there. They just need to kind of start talking to each other. And that's what we need, like the next six to 12 months timeline to kind of bring those integrations to fruition. Oh, interesting. So it's more of like putting everything together, making it easy to use for developers and just giving them just much easier tools to make things faster and simpler to develop. Yes, exactly. And so with Edge and Node, we're one of the core devs on the graph, but we're also helping to kind of solidify that decentralized Web3 stack. Um, and Nader Dabit, who's on the Edge and Node team, he recently put out a post and he was previously at AWS. He helped kind of build it up to what it is today. And he recently put out a post on the Web3 stack and all of those pieces. So anyone listening can kind of check that out just to see the emerging projects within the Web3 space. But before we dive into it, you know, start with the problems because you, you've done a really good job identifying the 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 hidden you know misses or just kind of the misconnections of what Web three still needs from an infra infrastructure standpoint. 
Um, and compared to web one and web two, there's no, like, we don't have to bury any lines. There's no digging. Uh, there's very little picks and shovels unless we're talking about, you know, mining and, and validators. Um, but what was that, what was that first, like, this is a problem that needs to be solved for people to be able to understand how to use web three. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think it, it really started with Ethereum and Ethereum kind of coming in and exploding like crypto beyond just money into like every use case and every asset class. And with Ethereum, one of the benefits is that it's open source, decentralized, permissionless, and trustless. So it doesn't make sense to put a bunch of centralized, like closed source stuff on top of blockchains. That's kind of bringing that Web 2 stuff into Web 3. And that's not what we're here to do. We're here to really like make an impact and, and make sure that users are no longer the product that users kind of have that power back in their control and that decision making back in their control. Um, and so it, it started with that. And with the graph, when Yaniv, Brandon and Giannis, they came to actually build an application on Ethereum back in 2017. And they noticed that this very core piece of the stack was missing. They're developers, they come from um, Salesforce, MuleSoft, Microsoft. And so they have really had a lot of experience with dev tools. And so they're like, okay, well, we'll just build it because the space desperately needs this piece of the stack. And so that's when kind of the graph was born and we built with decentralization in mind, those core values of Ethereum in mind from day one. Um, and so there have been a lot of founders in the space that have done similar. I would say Sam, the co-founder of Arweave, which is that store, storage layer where it's stored permanently forever, um, has very similar values to Ethereum and also Bitcoin. And um, yeah, so it's kind of like all of those founders that have built through many bear markets, four plus years. Now all of this this um, work that they've done for so long is kind of coming to fruition. You know, I, I, I was talking to uh, a big VC yesterday and, you know, just ask him how he's doing. He goes, oh, my God, it's so busy. Everything's so crazy. I, I, I actually I don't you know, he's like, I just hope for a mini bear market so we can get a few things done and, and slow down the chaos because the space is going so fast and it needs time to mature. And when we're talking, you know, and, and, and I'd love to hear kind of your concept on this, on the speed at which this space is moving. Um, the old saying is, you know, for every day in the stock market, it's four and a half days in crypto. Um, you know, are, do you guys feel that when you're, when you're, I mean, as many projects as you've been involved in, you know, are you, do you constantly feel like every day when you wake up, I didn't do enough yesterday? Yeah, absolutely. I think I've been in the space for six years. It feels like two decades that I've been in the space. I personally love bear markets. Like people might be mad at me for saying that, but I really enjoy bear markets because it kind of flushes out a lot of the noise and it's just very high signal. And it's people that are kind of building for the long term with the right reasons in mind. I think that 99% of what exists within NFTs and, and crypto right now is probably not going to be around in five, 10 years. Um, and But that 1% is really going to change the world. Um, and so I think during bear markets, it's oftentimes like that 1% that's building and, and focusing. Um, and so, yeah, it, this, the, spe the, the speed is nice, but it also can be difficult and challenging. And right now it feels like there's a ton of money that's coming into the space, piling into the space, um, which is like inflating a lot of valuations kind of pre-token launch. Um, and we'll see if, if, if it kind of remains. Yeah, I, I'd love to learn more about like what that component is. Like what's the, can, can you give us the overview there? Yeah, absolutely. So Edge and Node is the initial team behind the graph. The graph is the protocol, it's the uh, technology. And so we are the initial team behind the graph. We are a company of about 55 people now. Um, but now the graph is like much beyond just the initial core team. There are now five core teams contributing to the graph full time, as well as many individual contributors. And the graph foundation, which is about like six to 10 people, that is overseeing and stewarding the graph ecosystem forward. Um, but with Edge and Node, we, we focus on the graph. We're really kind of we're core contributors, but we're also solidifying that Web3 stack and making sure that we move towards this very vibrant, decentralized future. And then Edge and Node is working on a few different like special projects that will live on top of the graph that, that we'll announce. Where do, you, where do you find the time to continue to, you know, you've got projects that are up and running. And, and these are, these are in, incredibly complex, very in-depth, and you've got a team of 50 people in and around Web3 blockchain. 
everyone is is crying about finding talent and and you clearly are succeeding with attracting talent and and then growing and launching more projects you know t- are are they coming to you or you're just you, you guys are that well known now that you're attracting them yeah, yeah we the exodus from web 2 to web 3 is on we've hired people from google aws airbnb cloudflare the list goes on and on so we're we're seeing a lot of people from these web 2 companies really get excited about web 3 i think google now has like a weekly meeting on how they can keep talent from leaving to web 3 so it's really exciting to see i think most people are are really intrigued by web 3 I personally think like this is the biggest opportunity that we'll see in our entire lifetimes. Like this is like being at on Wall Street, like early days of Wall Street. It's like being at the beginning of the tech boom. We're about to see like this turning point. Um, and in Web3, I think will change how everyone interacts on the Internet. Um, and so I think a lot of like the top minds within centralized finance and, and Web2 are seeing that and, and joining the space. Uh, but we, we definitely have a lot of open roles that we're hiring for still. There is a ton of talent. And with, with our company, with Edge and Node, we really are like mission and vision first above anything else. So that adds kind of a, an extra layer when it comes to recruiting because everyone needs to really believe in, in this vision and this mission first and foremost. You know, you're so privileged because you, you're most likely dealing with all the VCs and investors that already understand Web3, whereas, you know, we, we deal with the people that are like, so tell me again about this blockchain thing. And and so, you know, as you kind of sitting there, again, you're, you're refining, you know, at, anyone to do the graph, you know, thinking about that today, it's a huge undertaking. And you're now refining what the graph, and, and we didn't talk about Everest and some of your other projects that you, you've had, but I mean... You're sitting at this at the central point, not centralized, but the central point of helping really to grow this this boundary and go forward. And one of the first things you said a few minutes ago was kind of that transition from Web One, Web Two. W- what's the defining moment you think that Web Three, you know, is going to find? You know, what's that thing that's going to make it click for people? So I think that we'll see a lot more use cases. It's clicked a little bit with DeFi, a little bit more with with NFTs. I think it'll really change when we have social media on Web3 in a decentralized way. I think that that will be kind of like the turning point for a lot of people. And I think that we just need to refine some of like the user experience. Like it's still not super easy to be involved in crypto, like a lot of people have wanted to buy their ENS name to get like .eth. It's kind of like Venmo, but peer to peer with crypto. Um, and even just that, like walking people through that, it's like, okay, you connect your bank account to Coinbase and then you buy some ETH and then you send that ETH to MetaMask and then you use your MetaMask to buy. They're like, what is going on? It's like 15 steps. Um, and so we need to reduce those steps um, and also kind of decentralize some of those, those pieces involved in that process. Um, ENS, I think, will be like a core piece of, of Web3, just like domains and names. And one piece of alpha that not a lot of people know is you can actually get emojis on ENS and send money directly to an emoji as opposed to just like taken.eth as an example. Um, but I think like social media will really be like that turning point. Also with like the metaverse and being able to like hang out with your friends who are all over the world in the metaverse um, will be like another turning point. And then I think we'll be able to use a lot of the metaverse for like science and medical where we can model things in this metaverse world before we try it out in real life. Um, So I think it'll really change almost every aspect, you know, like doctors are like, is this going to impact my life? Like, yes, it will for that reason, as an example. So. Yeah. And, I, and I love you talking about communities because to me, that's the easiest way to define Web3 is it's the it's the removing of borders. It's the removing of nations. Your community is connected. We're, we're on a uh, type of metaverse type type call right now. We're just using uh, some traditional features. We're not quite it. We haven't thrown on the, uh, the Oculus goggles or whatnot yet. Um, but do we trust Web2 social media companies to help us usher in true decentralized Web3 protocols? I personally don't. I, 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 yeah, maybe Twitter, I think like they have good values, uh, but Twitter is more focused on kind of the Bitcoin ecosystem. And I think social media will happen with the graph and Ethereum, most likely maybe some layer twos. Um, yet to be seen, yet to be seen. We will live in this multi blockchain future. So maybe components are on different chains. Um, but community is extremely important. And I think within the Web3 space, like within the graph, like Edge and Node will stay a small team. 
like other core devs within the graph ecosystem will stay smaller. But the community right now spans, you know, multiple, like hundreds of thousands. In the future, I imagine that growing to millions, if not billions. Um, so it, it's really about the communities. It's not about any of these like com companies within the space. And, and the foundation, the graph foundation is really there to kind of steward that community forward. And everyone in the community has a say with what happens with the graph protocol. The foundation is overseen by a 10 person technical council that will likely shift into a DAO into the near future. But that technical council is there to listen to the community and vote based on what the community wants to see uh, before any changes are made to the protocol. Yeah, and you made that point earlier too, which I thought was really interesting. This idea that like their entire Web 2's entire business model is to not let Web 3 happen. Right. So like even just from a fiduciary duty standpoint, like I don't even know if they could. Right. Because like if Facebook says, oh, let's do this Web3 thing, they would basically have to throw away everything they have. So I, I think people are overestimating how much Web2 will be able to shift to Web3. And I think it's going to be more just like massive disruption of like new things will come along and kind of crush the old things. I agree. And I think maybe in the short term, we do see some Web2 companies leveraging aspects of the blockchain. But the real fun use cases that don't yet exist today will happen with that kind of far edge on the decentralized, like radical up, like changing of, of what's happening on the web. Um, and that's what I'm really excited for. I'm excited about those new use cases as opposed to like web two with a little sprinkle of web three. Yeah, the other interesting thing too, like, and you kind of mentioned this, but like, I've really been expecting that politics will become bigger in like web three. Like, it feels like with all these communities and all the at least attempts at democracy we have, I've just been kind of surprised there hasn't been like, I don't know, a political party, like something to that extent. I'm not sure how excited I am for that to happen, but it's kind of interesting how that's going to end up developing. Yeah, I mean, I hope we can leave the bureaucracy and the politics out of Web3 <laughs> and crypto as long as possible, but you're absolutely right. I also think, once, so when I got into crypto, I was always like, this can go to zero tomorrow at the early days. That's no longer the case, right? In my in my view, like crypto is here to stay and it is now politically unpopular to dislike crypto. And that is only going to continue more and more over time. Um, what was it like? Um, there was a recent report put out that 33% of institutional money is in digital assets and over 15% of people in the US individuals hold crypto. So it is now like politically unpopular. Um, and so I'm excited about that, but I do think like politics can harm tech, right? And we've seen this with open source, we've seen this with HTTP. Um, and so I hope that when policymakers come into the space to make policy for Web3, that they're talking to the founders of these decentralized protocols and not just going to top VCs that are very invested in Web2 or top Web2 companies that claim to be Web3. I do see that as a bit of a risk. Um, but even if that happens, I think like because of decentralization, because of open source, you can kind of still come out the other end of that. Blockchain native politics, like not like the old school politicians getting involved in blockchain, more of like the emergence of like, like in your DAO, right? Like, do you suddenly have parties, right? Do you suddenly have people representing other people? So I think the, which by the way, I think like, I think we haven't done a great job at like electing representatives because it feels like to me that that's a more effective way of doing things than just straight up like votes. But so I don't know if that's one of the things I'm really excited to see, especially it sounds like you guys, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we we have kind of seen that with DAOs a little bit where you can like delegate your votes to someone more knowledgeable, but you're right. We might see more of that kind of rise up. And I also know within like the Ethereum Foundation, there used to be like the cast of characters. There was like Carl, who's now working on Optimism, obviously Vitalik, but there was also like Gavin Wood and Vlad, and Vlad was like a proponent of Casper. And so you kind of do have it a little bit, right? You have like these these individuals that rise up to the top of these ecosystems naturally, and then they their voices are heard a little bit more loudly than, than others. You know, looking at, and I, I want to very quickly move away from the politics, um, but, <laughs> but before, but before we do, it's probably a wise move before we do in the most PC way possible, what country or region do you see that's, that is actually adopting web three and blockchain technologies correctly? Yeah, I mean, I think it is more global right now. I think crypto and, and Web3 is really borderless. 
That being said, I do think there are regions that can benefit more from Web3 and, and crypto in general. I think those that have experienced like a high amount of inflation have really like, they see the use case of Bitcoin. They see the use case of, of Ethereum if, for that reason alone, just like a store of value. Like I want my money to be able to buy me something in the future. So I'm gonna store it in, in Bitcoin and Ethereum. And, and even over like the, the fiat dollar, like it's the US dollar, like it's been depreciating year over year since we came off the gold standard. And Bitcoin on the other hand has very much gone the opposite way. Um, so I think that that's just one really strong use case. We've seen El Salvador adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. I'm one of the radicals that think like that thinks Bitcoin could potentially become like a global reserve currency just because we have this fixed supply and there's no politicians to like inflate that away. Um, so yeah, I think that, you know, the countries that have actually experienced hardship are in a better position to adopt Web3 and crypto. Um, and that's really exciting, right? It's like everyone who has left out of the previous financial system or the previous tech boom has now an advantage over those people that are at like the top 1%, um, which is exciting to me. Well, um, and I think, you know, and I really want to point out, and I'm sure you're familiar with like YGG games and play, play to earn, which is, you know, being dubbed a little bit in some of these third world countries as play to live. Um, and, you know, we, we interviewed Gabby a couple months ago and, you know, he tells the story of, of how, through, you know, nothing more than a, a cheap Android phone, the kids are now sitting outside of the rice fields or outside of the, 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 the villages where manual labor is charged and playing a game and making enough money to, to feed their families and to grow and to get and to educate themselves and then eventually to move over into things like DeFi and, and, and are taught themselves really, um, you know, how to manage a, a global currency better than I think almost any high school uh, in the United States has done so. Yeah, absolutely. And I think beyond just like play to earn and being involved as like a liquidity provider in Uniswap or a delegator with GRT in the graph to earn, like anyone with access to Wi-Fi and a computer can join this space full time. Like, the, like, as you mentioned, there's a huge need for talent right now and there's not enough of it. So if you get in, you can get it on, tel on Twitter, on Telegram, get involved in these different communities, see where you resonate and you can work from anywhere in the world on these protocols with these projects. So I think that that's really exciting too. It's like anyone who, yeah, wants to get involved can. I'm curious on that. And I think one of the kind of the why whale thesis to just, I guess at large is like, as more of traditional, traditionally experienced people move into the space, right? And it sounds like you're kind of in that same boat, right? You're on from the iBanking world. You're not from the tech side purely. So how much of that are you guys seeing that more, are you more hiring kind of traditional roles now versus just on the engineering side? And is that kind of leadership shifting a bit from what you're seeing? Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's a common misconception that you have to be like a coder or a developer or technical within this space. Like we are creating a new internet and a new financial system. We need all voices around the table. We need operations. We need business. We need partnerships. We need sales, like all of it. Um, and so you can get involved. Also translators, like people in marketing, translating what the developers are doing is such an important component. So it's not only developers. Another misconception is that like you'll get paid only in crypto and then you don't know how much money you're earning because it's so volatile. Like you can get paid competitive salaries in fiat with what you're getting now. So um, I think like we as a space need to do better on educating that. And I also like I'm a huge proponent of people that are excellent, that are driven, that are hardworking coming into the space and us helping to like train them and coach them up. On our business development team, we hired uh, Kyle who joined us from Goldman Sachs and he, he's he been kind of playing and tinkering in Web3, but this is his first full-time role in the space. And I hope that everyone, like all the founders do the same, right? Cause we need to bring in the best people, the best minds and train them in Web3. And so, yes, there's a little bit of this learning curve but it's so worth it once they get over it. The, the learning curve is so hard to, to talk about. And I'd love to hear your feedback because so, so we at YWales, um, we, we are 30,000 plus, uh, CEOs, uh, owners, entrepreneurs from around the world. So we're entirely global. And each week we onboard between 20 and 50 new, uh, new members into our platform. And I would say that 75% of them have this, like, I want to understand what's going on here in Web3. And, and the first, you know, 
statement that we make to them is just relax. Just, just everyone, you need to chill out because you see so much FOMO. You see so much, you know, rushing in and diving in, and that's where the mistakes are made, and they get really quickly dis- disenfranchised because it's so – it's a, it's a whole different language. We understand you know how to use a computer. This is a different deal. How do you – you know, when you're grabbing a hold of these 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 rock stars that that don't have Web three exposure, like what what's that first conversation like, or how do you you get them up to speed where they can at least understand the terminology that we're speaking? Yeah, I think that within the crypto space, there really is in Web three, there really is this culture around attending events and talking to people. A lot of like the tokens and projects that like market on TikTok and and YouTube generally don't have a community behind them or like a lot of developers or usage. Um, So I think like step one is like going to events, talking to people, listening to podcasts, like listening to the real builders in the space and then kind of just educating yourself, reading the white paper, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, I think are crucial white papers to read. Um, But that being said, like one other thing that the Graph Foundation invented was the concept of like core dev grants. And I like reporters like to call this decentralized M&A or decentralized Apple hire. And so what we've seen is projects that were building in a centralized way that were competitive to the graph, give up their centralized product and join the graph in that mission and vision full time because they received this grant. And a portion of that was in like lock GRT over many years to come. And so now they're able to focus on like the mission and the vision as opposed to like making their stakeholders of those central, like that centralized products, like more wealthy. Now they actually like get to find purpose and and meaning by joining the graph. But we've also seen top Web2 companies, and this is how Web2, I think, can kind of get involved in Web3 as well. We've seen a top GraphQL company in Web2 actually join the graph full time and receive one of these core dev grants as well. So it's just kind of, you can join a company or you can kind of spin your own company into protocols. And I think that's really exciting. So now there's like six CEOs across the graph ecosystem, all at their own uh, autonomous companies focused on the graph. So you're, you're growing, you're growing fast and you're growing wide uh, as well as deep in these areas. And, and you have a, a saying that I absolutely love, which is, you know, do no harm. Um, and, and well, yours adds on to it. Take no bull, change the world, but, but the t- do no harm, I think is a, is a fabulous example. Um, and, and my question is, Google, you know, said the exact same thing when they got started and they were really just this micro company and, you know, without getting political on them, I, I don't believe that statement exists in their, their core mission, vision, values anymore. How, how are you going to, going to protect the companies that you're building, um, from, from, you know, kind of some of these, uh, <laughs> I'll stop. Yeah, that. no, it's a great question. I think Google did start with very pure intentions, but they started kind of without a business model and it kind of in those murky waters. I think tokens are very much the next evolution of the business model beyond just SaaS. And everyone hates SaaS. Like, do you like being locked into a contract and then having like a pushy salesperson talk to you every week about like signing this for a little bit more and like extend your contract? Like no one likes SaaS. And so tokens are like the next evolution of the business model. And it's how you can have like sustainable open source decentralized technology without expecting like donations on that tech. And so... With the Graph ecosystem, because there is the GRT token, you can use that peer-to-peer in the Graph ecosystem. It's a, it's a utility work token. Um, so everyone kind of earns peer-to-peer, and you're compensated commensurate to the value that you bring to the Graph ecosystem. And I will say this is very much unlike investment banking, where you start as an analyst, you work 100 hours a week, you're paid the least, you have to climb up the corporate ladder, it's super bureaucratic, super political, and then you get to the top of the corporate ladder, you work less, and you're compensated much more. Like, is that the way life should work? No, it's not, in my opinion. And so I think with crypto, like this play to earn with YGG, with being an LP in Uniswap, with delegating in the graph, like you can get away from that and you can earn commensurate to the value that you bring, maybe for the first time ever. And so I think that that's super powerful. Yeah, I think your idea, too, of the, 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 the inverse of the business model, right, with Web2, just like we were saying, right, Google started by acquiring a ton of users because it knew that as soon as it had all the users that it owned all the data, it would just kind of figure out how to make money, right, which kind of has this inevitable, well, yeah, maybe we'll make a little more money by doing something a little less great for the users, right? And I think just the inversion now of like, no, 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 we start with a business model that actually makes sense, that's democratic, and that's wildly spread out. 
And then, and I mean, I think especially in 2017, there was a lot of like, ooh, let's find a use case to try to use that business model, right? And some of that didn't work so well. But at least now we are finding all those really good use cases that really have a lot of synergy with that and then kind of grow from there. So yeah, I, I totally think that's going to be really impactful. Absolutely. And I think another thing with Google is like advertisements became such a huge revenue generator and they, they encourage like tinkering and labs, but they didn't pay attention to any of those projects because they didn't compare to like that massive amount they make with ads. And I think within the crypto space, like you'll see more tinkering and more playing, but with those, like you can launch ecosystems and tokens and communities that will, you know, be very exciting for the future. And Yaniv, the CEO of Edge and Node, he's in the original co-founder of The Graph. He has this quote that I really like, and it's like, treat power like a hot potato. Like once you get it, pass it on as quickly as possible. And that's really like the ethos of the graph ecosystem. And it's really, we're here to lift other people up. And like the members of the community that are delegating or indexing, like they have more say than I do within like the graph ecosystem, which I think is really exciting and empowering for those individuals. That That's amazing. So I got, so, um, a slight pivot in something you said earlier, which is talking about how much money is showing up in the space. And that was not the way it was when, when you showed up on the scene in, in 16, 17. And now there's just a flood of money. There's these DAOs that are raising billions of dollars. Um, and we're seeing the, the issue that happens when too much money floods into a space with a lack of talent, which is the complete inability to execute uh, these roadmaps and you know the, these some great teams who are underfunded that have the resources, but don't have the money. And then you have the, the teams that have done amazing jobs on marketing, have all the money and, and no real timeline or thought that they're going to execute. How, how do you, how does that get resolved? How do people become educated and, and start pulling back on a little bit of the FOMO? Um, and I, the reason I ask is because you're at the center of this. You see the projects that have teams. You see the people that do an active development. What's the metric we're missing? Yeah, I think that there, this is just kind of a natural thing that happens with new innovation. We saw it with the dot-com bubble. Um, and I think that the best thing that can happen is kind of a mini bear market where a lot of it gets flushed away. Um, I think also there's a big learning curve. Like a lot of the venture capitalist firms that are getting involved in this space, they are funding more of the same Web2 stuff. And that's not what's going to be what lives long term. And it's not what's going to like make them the most money, in my opinion, like for their shareholders, for their LPs. Um, and so I think that that educational hurdle will happen over time. Um, and so right now, like it's not a lot of like there's not a lot of thought going into the long term. It's more like the short term and, and how we can profit short term. But I think that's just a learning curve that we'll all get over together. I This is why I take opportunities like this to kind of help educate um, and, and really like the, the decentralized Web3 staff will be what survives 10, 20, 30 years, what changes the world. And so the VCs should be putting their capital to the founders that like believe in those four values of Bitcoin and Ethereum. Otherwise, it's just more of the same and frankly, like, no fun. <laughs> so can I pick on the uh, the Ethereum maxi in you a little bit? <laughs> Please. <laughs> so, so, so talk about, you know, I, I am kind of of the, the consensus. There's going to be chains everywhere. Uh, layer ones, lots of layer twos. There's going to be tons of chains. Is, is Ethereum going to be the, the, the long-term winner? I, I have to say it's, you know, my un, completely unprofessional opinion and no one should ever listen to me on investment advice, but, but I, you know, I, I haven't seen um, them keeping pace with some of the newer, newer protocols coming out. How do you, you know, you obviously see things very differently than I do and you're very excited yeah. about Ethereum and Bitcoin. So, so talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm embarrassed my youth max is showing a little bit, but I do believe that we're going to live in this multi-chain future. Um, I think different chains will have different use cases. That being said, I think that Ethereum, like a lot of these L1s, like there's a lot of money behind them. There's a ton of marketing. When you look at the data, still like 66% of activity and queries and development is happening on Ethereum. Like when you look at the graph data, right, with those 27 different networks, 67% is on Ethereum which is a, still a massive amount. But if you look at like the headlines and the media and the marketing, it's like all these other chains are going to overtake Ethereum. I think it's a, it's a smart way to position yourself. Like if, if you're another L2, like go after like the big other L or sorry, an L1. Another thing that we're seeing is layer two blockchains on Ethereum. And this is how you can get 
the security of Ethereum and Ethereum, I will argue to the death that it is the most secure. Um, but it's L2 is you can get the security of Ethereum without the high gas costs. And so I'm excited to see more development happening. Arbitrum has seen a ton of development, optimism, ZK Sync and Starkware hopefully soon. Um, so I'm really excited about the layer twos on Ethereum. I think that will really help. Um, and then I'm also excited to see the different chains talk to one another and composability across the chains. Um, but what's exciting is that Bitcoin is the largest proof of work chain. Ethereum, as it moves to proof of stake, will be the largest proof of stake chain, uh, most likely. And so I think that that positions Ethereum really, really well in the space. But I agree. Like, I think Solana can, like, bring centralized finance into the blockchain space. And I think that that's really exciting. Do I think that Solana will overtake Ethereum? I don't, personally, but yet to be determined. But but no, I agree with you. <laughs> Ethereum's kind of, you know, planted a very good flag at a very good time. So, so your, your view would be more like the, and it, okay, I think one of the challenges that they're obviously having is getting stuff delivered, right? Which, by the way, is completely understandable. They're so huge. There's so much money riding on it, et cetera. But so your view would be kind of be the, the ETH, like base chain development being slow isn't all that relevant anymore because the L2s are just going to do all that. And so ETH just becomes a pure like security security provider effectively. And then the L2s kind of do all the stuff that the alt L1s provide. And you still think that the, I don't know, the burning, et cetera, is going to make ETH worth a lot more in the long run. I, I'm talking more like around development. You could look at market cap too. Um, I think they, they kind of tend to do to go hand in hand. Um, th this being said, like the graph is neutral technology. The graph is here to support every layer one, layer two side chain. But I am very excited about layer twos on Ethereum um, and those really like picking up a bit more steam than what we've seen so far. And what's interesting is that Ethereum with these layer twos has kind of backed into this like Polkadot parachain model. And the question I ask is like, why would you build on Polkadot if you can get the security of Ethereum without the gas cost on a layer two? Um, so again, like yet to be seen, but we have seen a lot of like marketing and excitement and money, frankly, around these other chains. Um, so Tegan, for, first off, that was a fabulous first section there and, and amazing. And I, we need to start off by congratulating you uh, for 30 under 30 by fours. Um, I mean, so, so not only are you being recognized in the web three crypto world, which most people like, don't like to admit is real, but, but Forbes, the largest financial, you know, reporting institution in the world is recognizing your influence into, into, uh, this ecosystem. So, so congrats on that first and foremost. What was that like? Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. I was nominated. I uh, had a really great conversation with, with those at Forbes and ultimately made the list. I made it under finance, which is interesting. I'm excited to see them maybe create like a Web3 or crypto category, um, but we're, we're getting closer, I think. Yeah, I think that'll be interesting to hear, you know, over the next uh, couple of years that, you know, the... Um, the finance people are not going to want to associate <laughs> with you anymore. But do you like when you're now with, with your education and everything you've been in the banking world and where you're at today, you know, there was that moment in that kind of web two, web one, web two area where Napster was, was becoming really prevalent. Uh, Tower records and all the record stores were just like, no, this is a fad. It's never going to happen. It's not going to be there. And they completely ignored and any type of digital adoption. And we saw, you know, uh, Blockbuster do the same thing with, with Netflix and, and whatnot. Um, do you think the banks are going to actually figure this out, that they should hurry up and, and adopt before they're left behind? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think they already are starting to kind of accept it a bit by offering different products and with, with different ETFs. And um, I know, like, Grayscale has been a, a great way to get access to this space like a more traditional uh, capacity. I think that we'll see much more around that, though like the regular the regulatory space kind of has to catch up with the crypto space before a lot of it, of those large players can get involved. But the banks can lobby for crypto. I don't know if they're going to be doing that anytime soon. Um, but I'm excited. I, I think that like the wise ones have already started to get involved and think about this and and that long tail will kind of join in as well. Do the banks, is it almost too late for them? Um, and I, I say that because I've got a 14 year old and I see these 14 year olds, they're all on, and I hate to tell you this, they're all on Solana. Um, that's where they get their NFTs. That's where they're, they're playing with tokens and, and, you know, they're, they're betting, uh, on video games. They're betting on sports and, and they're using, you know, very low gas chains to move money back and forth. Um, and, and I know again, 
you know, obviously my, my son's probably a little bit more uh, blockchain adapt than most of them, but I hear his friends come over and they're talking about, yeah, I'm saving for college. And, and they're not talking about how many dollars they have. They're not talking about, you know, when they want to buy a car, you know, what, what summer job they're going to get. They're talking about liquidity pools that they're in. And if they can continue to get these APYs, you know, in two years, they'll be able to buy a car. Are they almost, I mean, again, and this, none of this has been taught by the schools. This is what they're learning online. Do we think that, that, that the banks can still um, grab a hold of this next generation or are they going to be lost? I think that it's leaning more towards like this decentralized finance space. I think that the banks have really like extracted a ton of value from people and they've lost a lot of trust. And now we have an alternative solution. So the competition is there and, and they need to compete. Um, and I, I would almost recommend, like, instead of fighting it, like, create a, a new entity or create a separate entity that you can actually start to get involved and participate in DeFi, because we need the knowledge of the bankers. Like, so the bankers that I worked with are some of the smartest people that I know. We need that knowledge in the DeFi space. And we've already seen a ton of bankers, like, jump ship and create their own DeFi protocols. But I think it would be cool if, the like, the, the top bankers of the world create their own projects, maybe side projects or, or like additional, I don't know if you would create like a DAO or a company. Uh, so, so in your, so in your professional opinion, having come from the banking world, banks need to at least be educating their employees on what it is and what it isn't. Absolutely. Oh, there are so many people that are, that need educated, right? Like there's a lot of wealth out there that, and they have no access to crypto. They think crypto is a scam that is only used to buy drugs, that Bitcoin is bad for the environment, like yada, yada, yada. Blockchain is not, not crypto, like all this ridiculous stuff. Those are narratives that exist within a lot of people in the world. And so banks can, they have access to those people. Those are their clients. Like they can educate them and help them get involved instead of fighting this. Uh, but also, like, the opportunity cost is really high. And so if you're at a bank, if you're still in banking, like, I recommend getting involved in the crypto space, getting involved in DeFi. Like, come build, tinker. Like, you don't have to maybe do it full time, but at least educate yourself on the side. How? What, what would be a good first step for, for someone who's listening, who's a banker? And, and we have dozens and dozens of them in our, in our listening. In fact, some of them own the banks and are truly now trying to understand how to get into crypto. What would be that first step? I would say start playing with these different DeFi protocols. So like take some money from Coinbase, put money into Coinbase, buy Ethereum, put that into Uniswap, be like a liquidity provider there. It's like how you have automatic market making. Like it's very exciting. Um, and so like start tinkering, start playing around. And I think as you start to get more familiar with the tech, you'll probably have like a ton of ideas of things that you want to start. Um, and so, yeah, I think the first step is really just, just start playing with what exists currently. Another thing like that exists within DeFi that doesn't exist and can't be done in the traditional space besides AMMs is flash loans. Like you can take out a loan in a flash, use it, make a ton of money and pay it back within like seconds. And that's so that's like these new concepts that you can't do in traditional finance, play with them and you might find like a newfound respect for DeFi instead of hating it. I love yeah, that. I think your point too of like they have extract, extracted so much value from people. And that's actually right now kind of have, like I'm doing a whole bunch of like traditional banking or related stuff and the fees are just nuts, right? I'm like, like, so I feel like that like drive towards like, hey, uh, you should be worried because all of this new thing isn't doing that, right? We're not focusing on extracting value from users. We're not trying to get as many of them as possible and then charge overdraft fees. So I think that like ill will that has been collected, especially in 2008, 2008 as well. So I, I, I yeah. think your point there is, is super valid as to what's going to be a big driver for adoption. Yeah. And I think like, I mean, not to get into like the dark side of finance, but it used to be that the banks needed to get deposits, get money to be able to loan that money out or play with that money. During COVID, the reserve ratio was abolished. So you no longer need as a bank to have any money. You can just lend it out, play with it. Like banks can like create money into existence. And most people don't know this, right? Like you put into your spreadsheet that you're going to loan out $500 million. You loan that out, you collect interest. And what happens if they don't pay it back? There's no consequences to the bank. The bank just gets the stuff. And I think this is why we have like empty shopping malls. Like you drive across America, like there's so many abandoned buildings. And I think like this is one of the reasons why and i think it's probably only going to perpetuate 
now that the reserve requirements have been abolished. But anyway. <laughs> do, do you feel D- DeFi and overall Web3, do you feel like it is on its way to accomplishing, you know, equality, which is which is a really, I know, hard word to, to use? I am very optimistic about that future. I think that a lot of people have been left out of the financial system because of like the circumstances they were born into. Like you have a bad credit score because you couldn't repay a loan um, or you got a credit card and like couldn't pay your credit card back. And now this interest rate is so high and like you're maxing out your cards. You have no money. You're trying to make payments, but all you're touching is the interest. Like that's a reality for so many people in America. Um, and I think like with crypto, it's, it's a, a fresh start, right? Like you don't need a credit score. You can just get involved and in, like your reputation of how like you loan something, you pay it back, you loan something like you don't have to like prove your credit score. So you get this like fresh start. Um, and I think that that is already creating a ton of opportunity for people globally. Um, and I think that that'll only continue. I love it. So, so let's talk, uh, let's have some fun with web three. You're, you're, you're ingrained in the space. You're, you're all over the internet. You're, uh, web one and web one, one, two and web three. What, um, what's got you excited? What are the, what's the things that you're seeing that that's either out now or coming soon that you're just like, this is a game changer. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously the graph is like this core component. So very excited about the graph, but beyond that, I would say, are we at the storage layer? I think will be like a huge unlock piece for a lot of protocols. I know Solana works a lot with storing um, NFTs on Arweave. So Mm -hmm. that at the storage layer, I'm really excited about Connext, which hasn't launched yet. So Arweave is is live, but Connext, they haven't launched yet. They are connecting its bridges between layer twos. So like bridges between Optimism, Arbitrum, CK Sync, Starkware. Um, which is really exciting just so that those layer twos on top of Ethereum can speak to one another. I'm also really excited about Celestia, which is also not live yet. They're solving the data availability layer. So I almost think of it like this layer zero. So what happens is like you have this data on the blockchain. You can't prove that that data is what it is. Celestia solves for that. You can think of it kind of like a hash of what's on the blockchain, like proving that it's there and it hasn't changed. Um, and I'm also really excited about ceramic at the kind of identity layers through Box Labs. Uh, so there's a real, there's a ton of exciting protocols that are like yet to be launched, which is exciting. Uh, that have been like I've been building during the bear market with the founders of these projects and protocols, and so I'm excited to kind of see them come to fruition. But yes, a bit of a bit of an alpha job there. No, no, that's good. So jump back to ceramic. I, this, that's one that I've I've heard, but I don't understand enough yet. Yeah, so Ceramic is a decentralized open source platform, and it's how you can kind of create hosting and, and share data. Um, they also have a really like nice identity protocol with um, Three Box Labs. So I highly recommend looking into Ceramic, and you can find on edgeandnode.com, you can find the Defining the Web3 Stack blog post by Natter Dabit, and a bunch of different protocols are listed there, layer ones, layer two, side chains, like really defining what that decentralized web three stack looks like today. Um, so yeah, I recommend, recommend checking it out. Love it. Love it. Who's going to, who's going to win the social game in web three clear, clearly, you know, you, you've, you brought up and we don't have to talk about the web two companies, but, but web three would solve the, the freedom of speech issues. It would solve the, you know, kind of being pulled off the internet um, type things. Who, who's right now winning that game? Yeah, I think it's a lot of these protocols that I just mentioned, like a combination of using like layer one, like maybe Solana, maybe Ethereum, um, combined with like our weave ceramic, the graph. Um, with the graph, what we're working on is verifiable queries and verifiable indexing. And this will be a huge game changer for Web3 because any individual can verify that data like themselves at a very low cost in real time. And so it kind of solves a little bit of this like fake news piece. And so that combined with the the pieces of the stack will really like be a game changer when it comes to social media. Um, so it's like owning our identity, owning our data, but also being able to verify that data, which is very possible. So 
Do you see it? Okay, go for going forward. So, like, I mean, obviously, there have been several uh, kind of more decentralized social, like, standalone protocols that launched basically L1s, right? So, do you see the future of DApp development shifting more towards instead of launching an L1, you just use these infrastructure providers as such as the graph, and you build more DApps on top of that, so it becomes much more of a I would say a traditional internet startup, right? Where you're saying, hey, I'm going to use whatever AWS and these other four things to build something and then launch it. And so where the decentralization becomes really more of a service you use. So you see it more moving into, into that direction? Yeah, and the graph really helps with that interoperability across all of these different layer ones too, because the developers can just build subgraphs as opposed to needing to like dive deep into the code. And subgraphs use GraphQL, which is a language created by Facebook. It's used among Web2 developers. So it's a really easy learning curve when building in Web3. But the other thing that's really interesting is like everyone has been so focused on rights and like scaling the blockchain. And that's why we've seen so many of these layer ones pop up. And also because we've seen scalability issues on Ethereum, right? Like they're not just popping up for the sake of popping up, they're popping up to solve a use case. Um, and I think the next focus is everyone will start to focus on reads and that's where the graph comes in because queries on the graph, which are paid for in GRT, they scale infinitely with reads. So like every time you search the blockchain, every time you read the blockchain, like you're reading that with GRT via the graph. And so while everyone's been fighting for writes, the graph has been like focused on reads for the last four years. And I'm excited once we solve writes for that mind shift to change. All right. So, so my last question, this is as easy as it gets. Are you into, we, you mentioned NFTs. Are you an NFT person? Yeah. So I, I love NFTs. I think that I come from a family of like artists and teachers. And I think that a lot of artists have really been left out of a lot of like the finance piece of society. Like they're not really compensated commensurate to the value they bring. I think that art dealers, like they'll buy a piece of art for like 10 K and then sell it for 10 million. The artists don't get a piece of that generally. And I think NFTs are really how we solve for this. Um, there are problems with NFTs, like when it comes to the stack, but I think those will be solved in the next like six to 12 months. Um, but I am very excited about NFTs. And that being said, I think we're in like a very big bubble right now with NFTs. Um, I, I hold like moon cats, I hold crypto punks. So it was like, like the OG, um, NFTs. I've kind of stayed away from a lot of the other ones unless I'm really like called to them. Um, but I'm excited to see this shift and not just with art, but like in game collectibles, digital fashion, like the next generation, they want, like, they don't care about a painting in their house. Like they want to be able to show off all their stuff digitally and NFTs kind of unlock that for them. Um, so I know like the OG art collectors don't really get this movement, but I really think like the younger generation really understands like the, the NFT space. Well, so I, we're a big believers in NFTs as utilities. Um, and so our community, and I, again, I, I look at Web3 as being a community-based, um, you know, endeavor and, and less of kind of the individual and the larger and more powerful your community is and the more, you know, kind of breadth is, is the more you'll be able to do. So I, as, as thanks for coming on to our podcast and talking to our users, we have our own, uh, NFTs and they, they are utility-based. Um, so we run our own contracts and these are what we refer to as our whales. Um, so we have crystal whales and they come in all sorts of, uh, various colors, shapes, and sizes. And these are fully ready for the metaverse. And by the way, if you can please rename this for us, cause you know, Zuckerberg stole the name from us. Um, we would absolutely love it, but I would love to give you one of these. Uh, they are, we have them on, uh, we have our own individual contract, not only on Ethereum, but also on Polygon. So you can absolutely praise us there coming soon to Solana. Um, but you can choose whatever, whatever one you want. Um, this is, this is FOMO, of course, cause he's gold. Um, and you can pick any name and I'm happy to show them to you. Amazing. Thank you so much. I love that you, you all are getting involved in this and yeah, you're more adept to the, the NFT launching than, than I am. <laughs> well, they actually do have utilities. So, uh, we're rolling out pretty soon the ability that if you hold these whales, um, we get white, whitelisted all the time as a community. We're offered, uh, NFT projects. We're offered, you know, different ICOs, ITOs. Um, and so we use these to track the wallets that they're in. Um, and so basically by knowing what wallet these are in, we can provide that whitelist at the time of the drop, uh, for, for people like yourself or our members to be able to have, uh, have these. And they're, they're up on open seas, but, uh, this is the members only minting page is what you're looking at here. 
Amazing. Yeah, very exciting. Thank you so much. Yeah, Gary Vee is, I think he's opening a restaurant in New York City where you have to hold a certain NFT to get access. And I think like to get certain access to the menu, like omakase sushi, you need like the omakase NFT. So I'm excited about like those use cases, like the social use cases, like you show your punk to get into this VIP party, but also what's probably going to spin up around NFTs around like passive incomes. Like you can loan out your crypto punk to someone who doesn't have one so they can attend this event. Um, I'm excited to see like those things cr- be created around NFTs. Fabulous. Well, we, uh, Tegan, again, we want to thank you so much uh, for, for coming on. We're going to get you one over these uh, crystal whales here shortly. Um, but, you know, from, from all of Y Whales and, and YPO, we really, really thank you for your time. It was a fabulous interview. How, how can people reach you if they want to know more? Just want to follow uh, the graph, Edge Node, and everything else. Yeah, absolutely. So you can find the graph on Twitter um, the, at Graph Protocol, also the graph.com, edgeandnode.com, and then I'm the client venture. I'm on. Uh, TikTok now, Instagram, and Twitter. So yeah, you can find me there and my DMs are open. Fabulous. Fabulous. All right. So hang out here for a second and uh, thank you again for everyone watching and we'll catch up with you here soon.